I'm here today with Bill Ortz, who's a scientist at the USDA's Agricultural Research Service, and he has devoted much of his career to understanding something that is a big part of this year's Earth Day theme of planet versus plastics. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at ARS? So our group tries to add as much value to agricultural products as possible, and our specialty is bioproducts. So we try to make non-food items that are useful and can be, be commercialized. Okay, wonderful. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to talk today a little bit about plastic. So maybe um, in looking at that, can we start by just saying a little bit about what a plastic is? Can you tell us about that? So originally a plastic was a material that's moldable, the term plastic. So you can make sheets and you can mold them into any shape. More recently, at least consumers think of plastics as synthetic materials, usually derived from petrochemicals, um, that are like items that um, are not necessarily degradable, will go to landfill and stay there a long time, like soda bottles and um, films and, and plastic bags. Okay. And so is there something about plastics that makes them distinct? Is it something about the, the material they're made of? So what makes them distinct is you start with small molecules that are almost throwaway molecules from the oil industry. So if you have a barrel of oil, the first 60% or 70% goes to gasoline, jet fuel, diesel. And then there are a lot of small molecules that get from that barrel of oil that when you link them together become our plastics. Polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. The poly means many small molecules put together to make the materials very different from their original molecules. I see. So when we talk about plastics today, then, are we basically just talking about things that are made out of petrochemicals? So when we think of plastics, so most people would say bioplastics when they're not from petrochemicals and would say plastics are from petrochemicals. They're synthetic okay. materials put together in long chains. Okay, great. So you mentioned bioplastics, and you had said earlier that you work on bioproducts. Can you just elaborate a little bit on those terms? You've started to tell us a bit about the difference, but can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, so bioplastics are generally not from the petrochemical industry. They're not generally synthesized from petrochemicals. So they would be either from, from corn products or fermentation of sugars or other things into those similar plastics, um, but they're biosourced. I see. So it sounds like they can do a lot of the same things that we think of plastics as doing, right? They can. So I, I brought along examples. So there's two forks that were kind of the forks in this hand we're very proud of. We work with a company, uh, World Centric, that makes them out of corn. Originally, this is corn fermented into an acid that's made into a plastic. So this would be a bioplastic, and eventually it's fully compostable. All right, you send this to a, a good compost facility. Looks very similar to the forks you'd get that are from synthetic plastics, petrochemical industry. Now that's both an opportunity and, and a risk to the consumers, because how do you tell them apart? But oh, they okay. both function well. Right, we'll have to come back to that in a little more yeah. detail, but um, just to sort of make sure we've understood what you're saying here, it sounds like um, we can do a lot of similar things with plastics and bioplastics, but they have different properties in terms of both how they're created and how they're disposed of. So if we use a bioplastic, there's not really a petrochemical involved in creating it at the beginning. And then at the end, it seems like it has a different impact than a plastic fork made out of right. petrochemicals might. Right. It's it's similar to soda bottles. So you can get one from polyethylene terephthalate. All right. So again, the poly. All right. And that's from the petrochemical industry. And they're not going to be degradable. They're going to stay at a landfill for a long time. You can get an equally functioning um, plastic out of a bioplastic polylactic acid, and it will be degradable. And both are out on the market. So so it sounds like the bioplastics have a lot of advantages. Is there a reason why we still see a lot of the petrochemical plastics in our supply? Yes, um, a bit of a head start. So the, the petrochemical industry is very good at what they do, and they've been doing it for 80 years, um, you know, since the 40s and 50s and 60s, making these materials that were almost 
way back then, throw away molecules from that barrel of oil and making them into really good materials. So um, before the 1940s, we did everything with natural, natural materials, paper and cotton and silk and all these other materials were what we used even for packaging. Cellophane was kind of the first bioplastic or plastic, right? Back then, wax paper. But then the um, petrochemical industry got very good at making plastics. And it sounds like for a while that seemed like a really good thing, but maybe the tide has turned now as we've learned more about what goes on with those plastics. Can you tell us about what happened? So two things are of concern. The source of the carbons, the source of the plastic, so it's coming from the petrochemical industry. So when you make a, a single use item like these forks, um, you're taking carbons that were fossilized, you know, fossilized carbons that from the petrochemical industry, and you're using more of them above ground. Okay. So that's adding, eventually they will degrade and it'll add to greenhouse gas emissions. The other part of it is end of life. So most synthetic materials from the petrochemical industry will take a hundred years to degrade right? Hundreds, perhaps, years in a landfill. And we aim for bioplastics that will degrade quickly and degrade back to natural. So the source will be from corn, not necessarily from petrochemical uh, industry. And then they'll degrade nicely in a compost facility back to basic elements. Great. And so it sounds like what happens at the end of a product's life is a big part of why we want to change to more sustainable options. Can you tell us a little bit more about the landfill, what kind of happens there once plastics are deposited? And we also hear a lot about microplastics. Um, is that related? It's very much related. Uh, so these, these single-use plastics that are synthetic are not going to degrade, but they will break down into pieces. And so, you know, they you have to add stabilizers to keep them together in, in the really long polymer form, but they eventually break down into smaller pieces. And those smaller pieces can leach into our, our waterways. So they can leach into our groundwater. Eventually they can leach into, you know, storm drains and end up in the, in the ocean. And the other possibility is litter that almost directly goes into the ocean. A lot of storm drains just take, you know, plastic bags straight into the ocean and they break down, but not um, not before becoming microplastics that will last for decades, if not centuries. So why is it a problem to have microplastics in our water? Well, we don't really know what the problem is, but it's a great experiment um, where we know that the plastics are going to break down and end up at the very in the food chain at the lowest level of the food chain. And we don't really know the impact of that, but it's really an experiment that um, we're kind of taking a big risk on. So we, we can't imagine it's going to be good for the lowest right. level of the food chain to be eating microplastics that eventually get into our our fish and our food supply. And especially now, and the other thing I didn't really bring in is it's not just the plastics, but most plastics work best if they have other additives in them. And it's the additives that have caused a big problem. They're called plasticizers or stabilizers. So it makes the plastic last even longer and keep its shape. Um, but it can end up, the big one was in um, bottles for children. It's okay. not just the plastics, but the additives were coming out as well. So that's all fascinating. Are there any other projects that you guys have in the queue that are going to help address the plastic issue? So another project our team is working on is to improve the safety of rubber and its additives. So tires are an important part of our everyday life and we wanna make sure they're safe. And in order to make a tire safe, you use natural rubber and you use rubber that's cross-linked and it has to stay cross-linked to be strong. Um, and there are additives that the industry adds to tires that prevents them from uncross-linking. So, a tire has up to 40 or 50 components in it, and some of those additives are really critical. So we work not just on the plastics but and, and rubber, but on the additives. And one of the additives that's of concern um, is, is something that prevents it from cross-linking. And when it's used, it actually can kill fish. So it's been discovered that tires wear away, tire dust, 
gets to the side of the road and eventually gets in our waterways. And one of those additives has been shown to kill soho, coho salmon and trout. And we want to find alternatives. Okay, Bill, you mentioned a term in your answer, additives. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what those are and how they fit into the issue of plastics? So most plastics, including that rubber and most plastics, um, don't perform exactly the way the industry wants them to or don't get formed into the shape without other small molecules additives that make them better. And those additives are also part of an issue. You want them to be environmentally safe and benign, and they aren't always. So it's not just the plastic. It's They can leach out well before. So, so the, the plastics are really big molecules, and they kind of stay put. But the little molecules can get out and get into our waterways and get into our soil. And so we want to make sure they're as safe as possible and sourced from a, a environmentally safe source. So what is the solution that your team is proposing or working on to address this issue with the tire additives? So the tire additives, we're working with the tire manufacturing industry, the industry group, and then the leading manufacturer of the additives. They embrace the problem. They're helping us reach solutions that are going to be more environmentally safe, environmentally safer, risk-free, and then still keep the tires safe so they don't fall apart on the road. And we're, we're very happy to be working with the industry leaders. I see. So is your team creating new additives that are made out of more sustainable components? So that's our target. So completely sustainable source of the additives. You know, a lot of these additives were, were developed 40 years ago, 30 years ago, and they work and the industry was built around them. But if you have to rethink it, could you source it from places that are not necessarily petrochemical industry? Can you use natural sources? And that's what we've been working with the industry on. If you had to rethink this, what would you do differently now that we know more about these products? Great. And what's the answer? Uh, optimism. Um, okay. We're testing products. So, so if cost is not an issue, we think we have a few additives that are getting close. And then... Can we scale it up and help the industry reach their cost points and effectiveness and then help them test these products? Bill, it sounds like what happens at the end of the life of one of these products is a pretty important part of how we think about it. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about plastics and what happens to them at the end of their lives? So in a perfect world, plastics are recycled. And, there's, and so the difference between bioplastics and synthetic plastics is what that end of life cycle looks like or recycling. So for a bioplastic, you would preferably send it to a good compost facility and it goes right back to its basic elements and then and could be turned into bioenergy. So everything's captured. In a perfect world, our synthetic plastics are recycled and reused. So a soda bottle becomes a soda bottle again. Unfortunately, we only recycle about 30% of our plastics. So 70% of a lot of material is a lot of material, all right? And it goes to landfill. And what happens then? Synthetic plastics take tens of years to degrade, if not a century. It will slowly release, it'll break into smaller pieces. Remember, they're, they're big chains, and they start to break into smaller pieces, and eventually they become microplastics. That's a buzzword that can leach out into the waterways, leach out from the landfill, um, and if it's litter, it leaches directly into waterways, all right? So litter on the side of the road breaks down into small plastics that eventually become microplastics, and it's a concern. And why is it a concern? What are we worried about um, happening? What are we worried will happen with microplastics? So microplastics are taken up by the lowest rung of the food chain, right? So eaten by, you know, can be taken up in, in a lot of cells, but in basically, you know, bacteria or, or small cell microorganisms in, in the oceans becomes the base, and then the fish will eat the them, and it gets into fish tissue and into our food chain at the lowest rung. So it's really a grand experiment we're running, um, unfortunately, where we don't really know what the effect of microplastics are and there's no single microplastic. There's a lot of different plastics, so there's not one single answer to how microplastics will impact our health, our food chains. 
You mentioned a term in the response about landfills where you talked about things degrading. That brings up a term we hear a lot, which is biodegradable. Um, and you also mentioned compost. So it sounds like there's a lot of terminology kind of floating around out there to describe the process of things breaking down. Is there a, is there a difference between being, say, compostable and biodegradable, for instance? There's, there's standards around that. So there's a difference to how people feel about them. And then there's a difference in ASTM standards between the two words. A biodegradable plastic has to degrade in a certain amount of time at a certain temperature to its basic elements. So that's the full term biodegradable. Compostable is a little looser, which means in a good compost facility at temperatures, it breaks down into natural elements. So that sounds like you, know, you need a lawyer to understand the differences. Sometimes you do. Um, but both are, are basically saying that they will break down into benign, relatively um, risk-free ingredients at the end of their lives. Okay. Um, so is that something that happens to bioplastics or regular plastics or, or both? It sounds like the regular plastics, even though they get smaller, don't necessarily turn into something we'd want in our soil or water. It will take decades, if not centuries, for a synthetic plastic to break down into something that is natural um, and a basic element. So it will be a microplastic for decades, um, floating around in the environment, in our waterways, somewhere in the soil, um, something we have to deal with. Bioplastics. Now, here's, here's a little bit of terminology that we need to get caught up on. You can make a bioplastic not degradable. So you can make a bio, but now the, the source of them is carbons that are from agricultural crops or some kind of residue. So they're what, you know, not fossilized carbons, not from the petrochemical industry. And then you can decide whether you want that bioplastic to be degradable or how long it takes to degrade, but eventually it will degrade to natural elements. And so if I had one of those bioplastic forks, it sounds like that's something I could feel comfortable tossing in my backyard and allowing to break down into elements of the soil that I grow food in potentially that I would eat. Is that true? At comfortable, but a slight bit of consumer disappointment because they're made to not, you know, not dissolve in your soup or in your hot stuff. And so your backyard might not have the temperatures so it might stick around looking like a plastic in your backyard. Now, a good compost facility allows the temperature just to rise a little bit. Oxygen stirs it up, gets in. So um, compostable by an ASTM standard usually implies a, an elevated temperature with some um, treatment to get the oxygen just right. Okay. Yes. It seems like there's a, a lot to know about this. And it's a it's a big topic that kind of has tentacles throughout a lot of our lives. We've talked a little about cutlery, but plastics are really in a lot of different parts of our lives, um, maybe even places we don't expect. Can you help us understand a little bit more where we see plastics? So the ones we expect are, you know, soda bottles, plastic bags at your supermarket, right? And these single use utensils. Um, it's really, the, the petrochemical industry got very, very good at making very good materials that are used in everything, including cars and jets. And so most furniture, um, clothing. So these are all different versions of plastics that have remarkable properties that we take advantage of. It's a big part of our life. Now, clothing might be one that surprises a lot of us because I don't think a lot of people think of themselves as walking around wearing plastic clothing. Can you tell me more about what you mean by that? Well, polyesters are a form of plastics. Um, it's These are polyesters right here, but it's a biopolyester, and you can make them into really modern, you know, I'm wearing a polyester shirt. Okay, so you make them into modern clothes. That eventually will end up in a landfill. And what will surprise people is, especially with fast fashion, how what percentage of the landfill is, is clothing and building material that's plastic-based? So polyester is actually a plastic, and there are a lot of other fibers I see in clothing, nylon, viscose. How does a consumer know whether these are natural? There are some that even say they're plant-based, but they use chemicals. So as a consumer, what, what do these terms mean? How do I understand them? I know it's complicated and you wish we had, you know, labels or something that said this is really, so you just said two and they were great choices. Viscose, 
actually comes from trees. So it's a natural source. It's a chemically treated form. Yeah, you know, it's glorified wood, really, turned into that textile versus um, nylons, generally from you know synthetic, from the petrochemical industry, cheap molecules that they make into remarkable plastics, remarkable with their properties. So what, I mean, what is a consumer to do? Um, one thing that we would like, and maybe for the manufacturers, so there's a, this is a very complicated issue, but you know, the, the difference between these forks, maybe one needs to be labeled to tell the consumer, this can go in your compost bin, and this one shouldn't go into your compost bin. And it, it's not necessarily clear from, from just looking at them. Um, clothing is more complicated. You know, you can get silk and cotton treated with synthetic chemicals or not. And what are you what are you going to do? I didn't give you a clear answer because it's a very complicated question. Okay, a lot to sort through. Um, so it also seems like there are processes that you've mentioned that consumers can use for at least some of the plastics. You mentioned recycling, for instance. Does that work? I mean, how should we as consumers be handling things that are supposed to be recycled? The very first thing as a consumer is reduce, right? So think about every piece of plastic, every package you use. You know, do you need something that's hyper packaged or can you get it more in bulk? and use less packaging. And then, you know, follow the rules of your municipality, use your blue bins appropriately, get the right plastics in there, and then encourage your municipality, vote, you know, I guess by voting to, um, or have a voice to, to do the right thing with those plastics. It sounds like the picture is very complicated. There are a lot of places plastics show up, but there's overall a set of solutions in terms of creating more sustainable, um, products. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you and your team here at the USDA's Agricultural Research Service are addressing the problem of plastics and, and helping to create viable alternatives for consumers? So the first thing we think of is the source. So the source of the molecules we're going to use, we prefer to be from agricultural products, co-products. And as a result, we know they're generally not from the petrochemical industry. So they're helping the rural economy. So maybe you take something like corn or some kind of fiber that, you know, cotton, corn, other things, you make it in a material that can displace the synthetic plastic. So the source is important. Um, the process is important, how to make them, what additives we use. So we can get into, you know, the, the risks of the additives you add to the plastics. And then eventually we think of the markets and end of life. So, so what kinds of research projects, for instance, would you and your colleagues be working on? You mentioned corn or cotton and, and transforming those. So multiple questions. So first question is, can you, um, can you use bacteria or enzymes to pr produce the plastics? So there's a series of wonderful plastics that are produced, a polyester, you can make textiles out of it that are directly produced by bacteria. So it's called polyhydroxybutyrates. We work with companies very closely to take advantage of, they can take greenhouse gas methane and make a textile or a cup or a soda bottle or a plastic wrap. It's a small company, so the price of that final material is not as cheap as synthetic plastics. Yeah, cost seems to be an issue in the whole picture of how plastics are spread throughout our system and, and the choices we have. Can you elaborate a little bit on how that fits in with your work as well? It is a big part of it. And it's because the petrochemical industry has been at this for a while. They built big plants off the refineries and, and they were making money by selling gasoline, diesel, jet fuel and other things. And when making that money, they could make big plants that then made really good plastics. The cost has already been built in already, you know, capital expenses that, you know, maybe 60, 50, 40 years ago built really big factories to make really good plastics. And the bioplastics industry is a little newer. And these companies have to compete with, you know, these trillion dollar refineries built by the petrochemical industries. And that's hard to match their price and scale. I see. So it's kind of a growing industry and it may be able to gain some benefit from the fact that it's added revenue, say, for farmers who have these byproducts or co-products of growing right. different crops. Um, but it sounds like cost is one factor. Is 
what they can do a factor to, or can bioplastics do everything that conventional petrochemical based plastics can do? So there are a lot of petrochemical based plastics. So, and that adds to the complexity of their end of life and recycling. There isn't just one. So there are fewer bioplastics that we're trying to match all those other synthetic plastics. So that's a challenge already. And match them at performance and cost is a really big challenge. That's been that's been the biggest snag right now. And scale. So okay. So you and your it's been a, a my career. It's been a life's challenge. It's it's my passion. It's my career. It's our opportunity. Um, yeah. So you mentioned cost and performance are two of the issues with bioplastics that you and your colleagues work on. So basically, we want to bring the cost to a point where they make sense for markets and consumers. And then performance just refers to what different functions they can do. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Right. So in packaging, we like really thin films that are stretchy. So you use, so think of something like saran wrap, really thin, clear films. You can see what's inside it. They're very, very thin. It's, it's almost a small miracle thinking how thin that film is that keeps your, your vegetables fresh. Um, so that stretchiness is hard to achieve. That has taken decades for the synthetic, you know, the petrochemical industry. It's taken decades to figure out how to make them that thin and that stretchy. And yet you want to do that with a plastic that you've only had maybe 10 and 15 years experience with at the same cost as that original film. Challenge. And is the, is the difference just because they're made of different chemical structures? Right. So it, it's a matter of these different chemical structures and there are fewer bioplastics than the synthetic ones. So synthetic, if you have, if you wanna make a jet part, you use one synthetic plastic. If you wanna make a soda bottle, you use a different one. If you want a shopping bag, you use a different set, you know, with different names and different end of lives. Our bioplastics, we only have about two or three that are are even close to cost um, competitive. Okay. Is it possible in theory, given the chemistry for all of the products that we make from conventional plastic to eventually be made out of more sustainable plastics? Or do we know that yet? No, we don't know that yet. Consumers can help know what you're buying. Think of the end of life. Um, for the short term, you may have to pay more. So if you want a compostable fork or compostable soda bottle, you might have to pay. Now, it might be hidden in the cost, but you might have to pay pennies more for the packaging. And are you willing to pay pennies more for the packaging? The other alternatives is to switch over to things from cotton or, or paper. Um, there You can modify, you know, would you take a bottle that's not clear, but if it was made out of paper, cardboard, or some other thing, just a total different alternative that you knew is compostable and has an end of life we can predict and doesn't end up as a microplastic. That is your choice as a consumer. Okay, so it sounds like there are options out there. Sometimes they're different in cost, but there are things consumers can do. And it sounds like you're saying one of the most important is just to think about the upfront choice you make at the beginning about how much to consume and which products to choose. And then I'm going back to the, you know, the three or four R's. So, okay. So reduced was R number one. Reuse is R number two. So can you get a refill option or or something? So, you know, water bottles come to mind. Um, so can you carry around your own straw if that's what you want to do? Instead of a single use item that could end up in, you know, as litter in the ocean as a microplastic and affecting fish life for, you know, decades you carry around your own straw or don't use straws, reduce or reuse. Great, so those sound like important principles that we can sort of apply throughout our day and throughout our lives. Are there some choices that have a bigger impact that we should focus on if we only have so much time and attention as far as minimizing our, our plastic choices? So recycling is, is something just, it's a good thing to do and hope that your municipality, that's that's an easy one early. When you're shopping, make choices, think about what packaging is involved and what's going to be end of life, right? So like think of a, you know, a little portable juice um, um, container. You're going to have a relationship, you're going to use that for 20 minutes, then it's going to go to a landfill and maybe take 100 years to degrade. Okay, is there a better option that than that particular package? And so be aware of the end of life as you're buying stuff. That's that's something that's really important. And then um, we want 
to work with companies that also think of end of life. So when you think how much plastic ends up in an automobile and they're very difficult to recycle, could they make it? So could some of their phones, instead of being a, a synthetic plastic in their phone materials um, inside a car, could it be from a fiber you get from the agricultural industries? You know, some kind of corn, uh, corn-based fiber or cotton or hemp fiber and and an easier way to recycle cars and building materials so they don't end up as landfill and turn it into microplastics for decades. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the research projects that you and your colleagues have worked on? I'd love to hear in a little more detail about some of what USDA is doing in developing new alternatives. So some of the alternatives are any single use item. Can we find a source of carbons that are from the ag industry. So can we replace the synthetic materials with something that is sourced from agriculture to make bioproducts, especially in single use items? So we work with the same folks that would make forks, films, plastic bags. Um, we make plastic bags out of bioplastics and test to see that they're degradable and make sure they get out to industry. Um, even as simple as the little plastic stickers, product lookup stickers on fruits and vegetables, making them fully compostable. So we're working with the industry leader. You know, the little stickers on an apple. So you go to your supermarket and you'll see individually um, shelved fruits, oranges, apples, peppers, and you see those little plastic stickers on those. So we can make them not, not from synthetic plastics, but from bioplastics with safe inks and fully compostable. Um, sources. Okay, so it sounds like when industry needs safer choices for consumers, you and your colleagues are working to create those for them. We create the products and then we also help explore the end of life. So what's the best end of life and where will it go and will it degrade as advertised to be safe and benign? And are you and your colleagues finding that there is an interest in the types of products you're developing from consumers, government, industry? Yes, to all three. Um, for example, we have work with a company that turns methane into, you know, these polyesters. They can't, and and or you can turn oils into the same polyesters. They can't keep up with demand. So all the wow. big multinationals, the fashion houses, the you know, shoemakers, Nike and, and above have come to visit and say, we want it when it's at the ton quantity. So it's a chicken and egg. They, you know, so if you can get to the polyesters to the right people and it's at the right scale and at the right price, there is a pent up demand. Okay. So it sounds like there are things that a lot of different sectors can do from consumers to companies to municipalities or government that people vote for or engage with. Any last thoughts for us, Bill, on things that you might want to talk about? Each of the big companies, the multinational, the supermarkets, are getting um, more and more environmentally aware. So um, consumer active, you know, Sierra Club and other groups have helped move the dial and these big companies. So some of the choices are being made behind the scenes and we really appreciate that by the big, big companies that sell you products, all right? You know, the Walmarts of the world. Um, they have responsible packaging folks at, who think of these things for you and are trying to reduce packaging. Um, what we can do is think to help them reduce packaging and single use items. So, you know, think of it, you know, if it's going to end up in the ocean, potentially, what would you want to end up in the ocean? And preferably not something that turns into a microplastic. Bill, it sounds like you're telling us that you and your colleagues have developed a lot of good options and that there's a lot of interest in them from consumers and government and industry. Yes, and I'm very optimistic. Look forward to working with companies and the government to get these out to market. I'm very optimistic. Terrific. Well, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for speaking with me today to help us understand this issue. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.